sense of our lives by telling stories to ourselves. The sound of reawakening. What thoughts? Who knows? Out, Herod, Herod! What the hell? <laughs> That's it, you know. RTE's He's first head of drama was Hilton Edwards, say. seen here in Conor Cruz O'Brien's King Herod Explains. You're right there. The, the, the public is always right. You, you know more than you think you know. You're, you're not such fools as you look. It's me you want. And I shall all Hilton Edwards came from the world of the theatre and brought with him some of the traditions of the Irish stage. I think some of the work ranged broadly in the theatrical canon, if you like to call it. There was Ibsen, Chekhov. My impression is that it was rather world theatre at your doorstep kind of thing, you know, which would have been in the tradition of Hilton and Michael and a lot of the kind of work that they had done. And also, I suppose, to a great extent, the classics of the Abbey Theatre were also done. Talk enough you have for this day and evening. There's a cake bacon at the fire for a short space. And Bartley will want it when the tide turns if he goes to Connemara. He won't go this day with the wind rising from the south and west. He won't go this day, for the young priest will stop him, surely. You had this mixture of European drama. You had the, the uh, which involved the classics. Uh, you had the, the Irish folk drama. You had uh, adaptations of Irish classics. Where's the bit of New York, Kathleen? Was bought in Connemara. The Irish people deserved this and needed this as part of making them realize what the cross wealth of television might be for them. This is what Dublin looked like in and around the year 1900. This was Joyce's Dublin. We brought the plays whole from the Gate Theatre to RTE. It was nice working on it because uh, the theatres, like the Jodrell Bank of the Arts, while well, television is the keyhole, and everything has got to be scaled down a great deal for telly. Oh, come on, come on, we'll get you home. I, I enjoyed the challenge of doing it for two different mediums, but you've got to pay attention all the time to the fact there's going to be a camera moving right into the eyes of the people. You've been drinking since Friday. Now, I wasn't to blame, Mrs. Ken, and I came on the scene by the merest accident. Oh, In the very early 60s, we did lots of very good dramas. You performed without the advantage of editing machines or anything, so if anything happened, you had to go back to the beginning. A lot of the television audience were not the kind of people who went to theatre or who read literary classics, and it actually did bring these, um, these stories uh, to a new audience. Jack! 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 O'Casey, Beckett, Bruckner, Ibsen, all featured in the first years of RTE's drama. But this dependence on original stage plays was slowly to change. This attempt to bring Irish classics into television production declined because there was more emphasis on doing things that were more specifically televisual. But I think it was the right thing that it received less and less emphasis. It soon became obvious that some of RTE's drama producers and directors wished to break out of the theatrical conventions in which they were working. Mr. Strang? Mr. Strang? What is it, Fanny? You've forgotten your gloves. Oh, thank you, Fanny. It was just so, so exciting because we were all sort of starting together, cameramen, actors, directors, everything else, we're all brand new. And the excitement of producing the stuff, black and white, of course. He's cut his throat. Cut his throat. This was the bigger audience, of course, you were being seen all over the country without having to go on tour, thank God. And that was nice. And here, sir, I am carrying this. Oh, good. Your Lordship will note that to all intents and purposes, the constable now appears as the murderer must have appeared. That is how, on the day of the murder, 
the three witnesses we have heard saw him. The man standing before you there in that dock. Even stage pieces could be reinterpreted in new and challenging ways for the television medium. This performance by Michael McLeamour was shot in two unbroken, hour-long takes by Tony Barry. Already, as you might say, at it. Long before the birth of Christ, indeed, she has been at it relentlessly ever since, in two languages, too. It was done in two takes, because the thing was two hours long, I think, and they had to have a break for the news in the middle. I decided I'd do it on a pedestal because it needed one mind in focus with MacLea Moore. Irish country people, I'm sure, have hardly changed at all for hundreds of years. Their minds and their speech still move in twilight between one mood and another, between sleeping and waking, fact and fable, between one language and another too, just as they did in the days when Spencer was writing his Fairy Queen in a castle in the county court. It was very well organised. It looked as if we were just kind of wandering with it, but in point of fact, verite is never really a casual business. It was extremely well planned, and we were very lucky to that end because there was no arrogance at all. In fact, it was a tremendously enjoyable carry-on. To mark the 50th anniversary of the 1916 Rising, RTE undertook a most ambitious drama project, an epic series which ran across each night of Easter week. They came to me in September and they said, we'll need the first script by the end of October because the whole thing has got to go out by next Easter. I found myself with a free hand. Uh, only in two uh, areas was there any censorship. One was, I think there was a reference to, uh, to Patrick Pierce's unfortunate squint and uh, that was removed. Today he is commander of the Irish Republican Army. And also the fact that De Valera began to... Uh, began to crack, his nerve began to crack in Boland's Bakery and uh, having fantasies about an, an occasional sputter airplane that flew over and uh, I wasn't allowed to mention him at all. I think the time has come. This was the scene outside Liberty Hall this morning. There had been a series which had been very popular in America. The concept being that the television existed at the time of great events, the, the murder of Julius Caesar, the crucifixion. The men of the Irish volunteers. I thought that would be a, an interesting way of doing it with an anchor man, Ray McNally. That the day of drilling and mock battle was over. And uh, I, think, I think that kind of worked okay. I'd like a telegram form. Mm, there seems to be some sort of procession going on out there. Awful people, nothing but ruffians and ragmuffins. Thank you. GPO, charge! The project involved the use of both studio and location filming, new editing techniques, a large cast and huge numbers of extras, extensive set construction and elaborate special effects. Volunteer, take that flyer from the flagpole! And I thought that um, for a television service of our size to have been able to put together an insurrection was a remarkable feat. Stay violent, cried the heroes. Come on, they'll you. They were absolutely able to move with tremendous speed to give the impression of action. And, and I thought that the staging, in terms of the troop movements and all of that, the special effects, uh, and the performances was really quite outstanding. As the GPO blazed inside RTE, there was a real anxiety that the studio building might also go up in flames. I can remember shooting with Ono Sullivan playing Pierce. He was leaving the GPO and I thought he was moving rather swiftly for a man that was saying goodbye to a place, but it turned out his trousers were beginning to smolder. <laughs> It's all very well to say that now, but what will be like in a few weeks' time? Grand, of course. Tolkaro was the first drama serial to be produced by RTE. It was not described as a soap opera, and perhaps it's not surprising that it too was based upon a theatre play. Look, Sean and I can manage Grand. Well, you'll be happier with Mr. Nolan. Tolkaro had come from an original stage play. And that may have constrained it to a certain extent. Will you get off to, your work? to certain specific structured um, elements which were stereotypical in a sense. 
And that's fish cleaning, you can keep it. No, no. You can quit your morning. It's mince and a bit of cold cannon. Just as well. If my friendship with Castle was hanging in the balance. Enough of flounders, is it? Enough of flounders here, follow me. Ah, now let me tell you, Charles Butler, there's many the time you were glad to see the beady eye of a flounder. So quit your moaning and ease us. It, it did its best, you know, but the resources we had weren't anywhere near enough, and the experience we had it wasn't good enough for it. And, and even that applies to the actress as well. Now listen, I might get Oliver to write, drop a line to Mr Nolan as well. Do that, Mrs Feeney. Should it be a pleasure, sir, or will Mr Nolan? They were still acting theatrically, and we were all writing theatrically and directing theatrically. It took us a while to, to learn how to get out of that. Mrs Feeney. Gosh, I couldn't believe the daylight from her. But, you know, for once, she seems to be telling the truth. It meant a lot to the people of Dublin to see people with accents like themselves uh, on the television screen. Two gay young lads, you want to watch yourself up there? What do you mean? The birds. Birds? Yeah, snap you up in no time. In a lot of the more theatrical productions, they didn't tend to see people like themselves. Oh, by the way, there's racing tomorrow. Yeah, Campton. Aye, Campton. That's always a good it was very gentle, and it wasn't really getting its teeth into the essence of what is happening behind the, the, the scenes. God, I need you. Behind the flats, behind behind the settings that you were shooting in. It was fairly mild. It was family stuff. I read in the paper only the other day that over a million people have emigrated from Ireland since 1940. I wonder how many of them came back. I think yeah. it was a bit off-key with respect to, to Dublin life at that time. Uh, what did it mean, you know, was it a really essentially a rural view of the city and I, I think that it, it did represent a sort of uh, rural interpretation of urban life. If Tolkaro presented a conservative picture of Ireland, the same could not be said of the Reardons. Using technology which was normally used to cover sports events, the new serial conveyed a powerful sense of authenticity. I would say that the Reardons wasn't just the first rural drama serial in Ireland. It was the first rural dram drama serial anywhere. I have to go up to see the doctor. Hey, what's the matter with you? He says a hangover. That's ah, Maggie. Nothing especially wrong. Just asked me to go up with her. Oh, well, go on, so Go on. John Coley was quite a primitive actor, but he was almost like a method actor in another sense, that he was a, a man who convinced the Irish farmers, particularly the whole country, that he was a real farmer. Hey, look, don't be bothering me now. We went to the, the Martin Minute, and I was directing it on that occasion, and uh, they bought a, a young cow that was about to have a calf. And we were coming out, and two farmers stopped Tom and said, you only bought the one. I have something I wanted to give to you. Have you? Yeah, but I didn't want any people around, you see. I made the, the wonderful prediction that it wouldn't last three months. It was successful almost immediately. Ah, oh, Benji. Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. The Sunday evening mass was put off to allow people to, to watch the Reardons because they knew they, the Reardons was too much competition. What are you thinking about? Do you really want to know? Bovine tuberculosis. The brief of the Reardons was to teach farmers where they were going wrong. But then Telefish Sperma began. You're not mad, are you? And it became no longer necessary to put out this information through the Reardons. OK, I won't mention another word about the farm till we get home, OK? Today. So we were free then to go on to more, more humane subjects. Where did you change your mind or what? About what? About going to Belly. Well, he was a, had a great nose for, for, for what is now called so. He had a great, great nose for getting the tapestry together of a village society. Well, you know, Minnie, how these things happen. Oh, I know, Mary dear. I know very well. And in fact, hey, to do that, the controller the sent him down to Kilkenny to live. Betty Brennan! My cottage was between the village and the creamery. What are you doing? And all the farmers knew that it was the fellow that wrote the Reardons living in this cottage. And they would call in on their way to and from the creamery and use wonderful local colourful language that they knew I would reproduce. But if Mary Reardon thinks that she can come back and, uh, uh, from her grand holiday and tell the world and Garrett Riley that I had a place like a pig sty waiting for her. And we all watched it together in the pub on Sunday nights. They would nudge each other and say, I told them that. You know. <laughs> Hasn't he got the rear nose? Your ear, like a banana. Ah, hello, Doctor. Hello, Mrs. Howard. Not a great day. Yeah. On the 
It was like a diary of Ireland. That is the serious part of it, upholstered with a lot of nonsense and fun and comedy and so on. You do have a bow tie. I do not have a bow tie. And what is more, I never had a bow tie. The issue of a little bit of chicanery within, you know, a local community in relation to land or money gave it an added um, spice that, that allowed it to live beyond the formal edges, so to speak, of understood drama. What would people say of me letting you go on working? A typical man's attitude. Almost from the beginning, Wesley Burroughs began deliberately to address the issues which most divided contemporary Ireland. We probably were the first drama series that took itself seriously enough to deal with contemporary issues. Well, poor old Benji. <laughs> it did the first marriage breakup. It was powerful stuff because this had never been mentioned on television before. I have to tell you that. Well, that another pregnancy could be extremely dangerous. The Reardons did cut a lot of new ground, both in terms of its, its methods of production and in terms of storylines, uh, things that were very problematic uh, in Irish society. And that, of course, raises the question of your relations as a young couple with, with a good, happy marriage. Well, any information you need, well, I can give it to you. I think that Wesley's role as a northern man living in the south gave a tremendous extra sauce to what was, you know, the ordinary daily life. Thanks, Doctor. Particularly because of my Protestant background, um, I was having a go at things like the, the rules of adoption in the country at that time and contraception and divorce and the whole... all of those things. Sexual morality uh, was one of the preoccupations. I think he had uh, an outsider's fascination with uh, rural life uh, in the south of Ireland. I've been reading all the stuff about, you know, the different ways, the safe times and all that. Yeah, but how safe is safe? Look, I know the time and place couldn't be worse, but... It's OK, it's OK, go on. Well, everything the doctor said the other day, it was hard to take it all in. But you see, it doesn't make any difference. Well, it makes a lot of difference. Not between us. I'm not going to let it. Yeah, but what can we do? There's a new pill, and it's the safest yet. I think probably sexual themes are, are the things that the audience want most, especially in, in the days when we were becoming liberated in the 60s and 70s. I suppose some people have said that, that, uh, that I showed an inordinate interest in, in sex. That's probably, possibly because the people putting those questions haven't enough interest in sex, you see. I think Benji's first preference would be... The most radical critique of Irish society was frequently offered by the very person who might have been expected to be the most conservative, the village priest. Yes, as far as... Tony Doyle. He was wonderful, really. Here he was, the radical priest. Oh. See. He was the first priest, actually, who was out on a limb on television. And people were beginning to question, like, should he be wearing the collar at all? But in fact, I think Wesley was right. I think the, the greatest complaints we ever had was the episode in which he persuaded Maggie that she could use contraceptives if she had settled it with her conscience, but it caused a big hoo-ha. And I'm glad to say there was as much for it as against it. I assure this there was, was a terrific kind of togetherness about it. And it did have a great social conscience. Of course, it was popular then to have a social conscience. It's not as popular to have a social conscience now. They now want some kind of tabloid stuff, you know, that will excise or titillate, and, and then it's gone. That was very kind of, very good for its time. Oh, glory be to God, such a man. He blames me for holding him up, and you're putting Oh, the right man in the right place. <laughs> come in, Brad, come in. <laughs> Don't get talking to strange men. For almost two decades, the Reardons entertained and provoked the nation. But for many, its greatest days were in the late 60s and early 70s, when it had seemed at the cutting edge of change in Ireland. <laughs> Any woman I ever worked with. Well, it's not you're not cross. Throughout its long history, it never failed to attract large and loyal audiences. It was strongly cast and, even in its final years, was still able to attract new acting talent. The Reardons ended its run on RTE television in 1980.
as RTE moved into the 1970s, there was the sense that a new creative generation was coming forward. Nowhere was this more evident than in one landmark production. What you had at that time, you had, you had the, the young people coming forward. They, were, they now had done their apprenticeship, in other words. And then you had people like Brian McLaughlin coming in and doing stuff like the Martin Cluxton. Sometimes I get browned off and I feel like lashing out at them. I mean, nobody cared anything for us. Why should I feel anything for them? It needed a young director who had a sense of the documentary as well as the dramatic. And in Brian McLaughlin, it found just that person. Think we'll be able to fix you up? Martin what Cluxton exposed the reality of social and class divisions within modern well, Ireland. 156D Corporation oh. Avenue. <clears throat> Well, we'll uh, write you have a vacancy. People for many you years thought that, that this was a fairly classless society. I think they discovered in Martin Cluxton, you know, the reality of a, a different world. They come from Corporation Avenue. Don't send them into me. Jesus, it's no use asking for trouble. Look, will you go out there in the flat and play football if you can't get anything better to do? You can't sit around here all day like as if it was a rest home. It was... Um, a very different picture of Dublin life um, than what was represented in Talk or Row. Must have been funny all them boys living together. I heard some queer stories. I'm not queer. For Jesus sake, I never said you were. It was much, much harder edged. It was much bleaker. It raised so many more questions uh, about Dublin life. It saw class uh, in much sharper, bleaker terms. It's a cinch. He's a little old fella. What keeps him talking out the front? Johnny does the back office where the cash is. Be easier with three, though. The impact of Martin Cluxton on, on the audience, I think, was incalculable in that people didn't believe the television could do that kind of thing. To have dramatised in your own living room a life that people perhaps didn't want to recognise was there. I think it had a huge impact on people at the time. If you haven't got a house, you have nothing. We consider housing as an essential need. For I think one indicator of the value of a drama is what stays with you. And there was one line spoken by one character in a pub that, I don't know, every few months somehow, something reminds me of. Babies don't get bit by rats in Fox Rock. Babies don't get bit by rats in Fox Rock. You know, the imagery is so strong and so clear. I can't think of anyone in talk or row saying anything like that. Martin Cluxton is a direct product of this environment. Now, spiritually, I can help him. But medically and environmentally, I'm just not qualified. It was absolutely primordially important. The sad part is, I suppose, that it wasn't followed, that there were no heirs to Martin Cluxton, in a sense. And these were really quite uh, extraordinary and quite revolutionary in the way in which they were treated, both technically and production-wise. I remember doing Hatchet and being slated for it because it was so violent and all of that, and I don't think it was by any means my best production, but I really wanted to do it at that time because it was getting into another thing. What do you think you're doing? You, Mrs. Bailey. But it's any of your business. Oh, it's business of mine, all right. Your son is called Hatches, isn't he? What about it? No, no, Johnny boy. When I get him, I'm going to cut his bleeding head off. I think that RTE was at its bravest and its best uh, in the 1970s. You can't help us. You can't help you. Complex then. sexual you themes were being addressed me. more openly, as in this piece by Neil Jordan. It expressed a lot of the tension of Irish society. It gave definite expression to contrary ideological points of view. You got the runs too? Yeah, I'm trying not to think about it. If you had them like me, you'd know all about it. And he's sitting in there... Urban the Deprivation was explored in this drama, written by and starring Jim Sheridan and directed by Pat O'Connor. He beats his wife, do you know that? RTE switchboards almost never stopped ringing during certain years with complaints. But I think that shows real drama when it generates that controversy where people recognise what they're for and what they're against. 
that makes two wives and a dozen children. In the 70s, there was original TV drama examining uncomfortable social issues, such as this play written by Maeve Binchy. It's all taking place here, just outside that door, across the street by the traffic lights in the church up there. But we have to bring him home, Pat. But this is his home! If them Negroes down south was to rise up even for... There was also room for experimental work from producers like Owen Harris. The song's been sung for a while. Well, I sure would like to see the white folks playing their music for the change. This was the Burke Enigma, RTE's first detective series, dealing with political corruption and graft, and directed by Brian McLaughlin. The running sore of bitter sectarian hatred in Northern Ireland was probed by Eugene McCabe in an extraordinary trilogy of plays, directed by Deirdre Friel. Wrong shop. Hey, well, we can't leave now. Yes? An orange and a half of whiskey, please. What kind? Irish. What kind of Irish? <laughs> Any kind. The notion of drama as the vanguard of change in Ireland reached a sort of climax with an ambitious series that was intended to combine hard-edged comedy with a radical social critique. The Spike was a series that had uh, a very ambitious, very progressive intent. It had a class analysis of the Irish education system and of Irish society. It generated controversy before it ever went on air, which is something which is little known. Various uh, religious orders just got wind of it and started to organize pressure against it. Conservative forces in Ireland may have been unhappy with the spike, but the storm of criticism didn't break until the seventh episode. This in involved a lady model um, for the class. And we rehearsed it and we realized, of course, that she would have a drape on her, which indeed she did. I was explaining to the class anatomical oh, nice. difficulties <laughs> and I turned around to, 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 um, to make some point or other, looking straight at this naked lady on the list, stark naked. This is the young... Um, and I dried stone. The classic reclining pose. And Jim Fitzgerald was playing the golden record. Had to come in through the door at this moment to make some announcement and not a word from them. Nobody had warned us that, in fact, the drape would disappear on the take. Never underestimate the element of, uh, of surprise. And there was some reaction. Mm. The reaction to this episode was led by extreme right-wing and religious groupings, who demanded that the series immediately be taken off the air. The same audience was seeing nudity on foreign television stations, but to see it on RTE seemed to be a different thing altogether. You must try to achieve what, in relation to landscape, the Italians call chiaroscuro. I've found that in Ireland all you have to do is have one person to say, isn't it terrible, isn't it a disgrace? and everybody else follows in, and the Irish Times is full of letters for the next six weeks. It, it arrived with a jarring noise, as it were. We hadn't developed th that kind of thing into an Irish context yet. It's anonymous. There were those who felt that the series had left itself open to attack because of the uneven quality of its storylines and scripts. Your furrier will now have removed all the excess hair from your pelt. The series did have its own weaknesses in the production, in the script, which undermined those who wished to defend it. The uh, Know Your Fur ladies will have to share this room with the cleaning science group. It wasn't as cohesive as it might have been in terms of getting it all together and making it all kind of credible. RTE collapsed under the pressure. The series was immediately scrapped. The remaining episodes were never shown. Those that had been shown were never repeated. Murdish Machanil, who was the controller, said that he thought that RTE did two things wrong. One was to put it on the air and two was to take it off. Watch it. We don't want to be getting complaints. They should have stuck with it and they should have finished it and they should have moved on to another one. You are part-time. I am permanent. I thought that the spike could have been the beginning of the Roddy Doyle era of 
you know, television and writing. I demand an explanation. The fact that it was taken off suggests that there really was something new happening, perhaps. It wasn't comfortable, that it wasn't liked, and that therefore had to be suppressed. The effects of this surrender by RTE were to be felt within the station for years to come. I think resentment, rage, lack of morale were part of the, you know, uh, legacy of the removal of the spike. Uh, class dismissed. It was at the end of the 1970s that RTE began work on a new type and scale of production. Produced by John Kelleher, based on the novel by James Plunkett, and brilliantly adapted for television by Hugh Leonard, Strumpet City set new standards of production for the station. Strumpet City was, was a very, very sophisticated production. It went back into the, the history of Irish society, uh, but it did it in quite an interesting way. It showed life as lived from different class points of view. We brought a few sweets for the children. And it orchestrated them very effectively and very honestly in relation to each other. It was very, very skillfully written and, and very well produced. Mr. Tierney, you said to give you a call. I knew I had the script. I was beaming inside about the script. And I had a terrific relationship with you, Leonard. Are the houses as infirm as that? Nonsense. I just followed the book. The dialogue, I didn't have to change. All I had to do was cut and shape. The actors who read the script loved it. I got a fantastic cast. It just was right. <coughs> Jim Plunkett is an, is an old friend of mine anyway, but in the 60s, he was writing this book called Strumpet City. And I thought to myself, if it's ever dramatised, I would give my ITs to play the part of, of Rashers. And it was a miracle, but 19 years later, I did. And it was an extremely well-realised piece of television drama. I think that m made the viewer sit up and realise that RT could give them this type of programming. And from an RT point of view, I think it gave the confidence to attempt these large-scale drama productions. Well. Which for a small organisation then and um, even now is quite a difficult thing to do. It, it, there you are, Father. Indeed, as you say, here I am. And what's more to the point, here you are. Aye. I, I, um, I was just entertaining my friend, Mr. Hennessy, to a cup of tea, Father. It had a very heavy impact within the station. It gave confidence to RTE that it could produce world class television drama. It was a bloody good story. And within that story, it touched on so many things that were still relevant, really, even if it was a period piece. And to that extent, it, I, I was very attracted to it. I only had one problem, the image of uh, Jim Larkin. Jim Plunkett showed him as a kind of a distant figure shouting from a balcony or on the docks. And it was a question of whether you were going to have him or whether you weren't on the screen. I said, well, he's not a deity. And they were talking about Peter O'Toole. And of course, once they talked about him, uh, I started writing in scenes for him. These are powerful people. Ask them for threepence, three red pennies. Ask them for your rights, and they'll see you go jobless first and your children starve. They did it to those men. And tomorrow, if you let them, they'll do it to you! I mean, it was terrifying in that I remember going to the canteen and, like, wondering what was being said at tables. There were lots of other forces, from the Director General to you name it, who were opposed, really. So there was a big fight on. It went to 54 different stations around the world. It's in nine languages. Like it's, I, I've seen part of it in Russian. Like it's extraordinary. Come on in now, by your point. At the heart of the drama was the character of Rasher's Tierney. Oh, come on, Rusty. Even though Rasher's lifestyle is, is, is very sordid and squalid, uh, at the same time, Dave managed to infuse the character with, with his own kind of humour. 
and uh, he's a very endearing character, and I, I think I think people warm to that. Tell us, where'd you get the ballot? I made it up. Get away. Out of your head? Not at all, no. Sure, the ballot made up out of your head is damn all use. That was me heart. The key to the character was the absolute dignity of the man. Russia's tyranny part of the revolution. Despite the rags. And um, I think that's what did it, really. It's the point that we refer back to. We, we proved to ourselves and to everybody we could do it then. So it's now a question of having the resources and all of the other things lined up to enable us to go forward and do that type of production again. For many, Strumpet City remains the high point of RTE's drama history. The station had invested major resources in the series and its courage had been rewarded. After Strumpet City, it seemed briefly that anything might be possible. God will be good to us. Be like it used to be. The next major drama series which RTE undertook was even more ambitious than Strumpet City. The Year of the French was a much more elaborate and expensive production. Filmed in three languages and on a lavish scale, Expectations for the new series could not have been higher. It's O'Donnell and your farming, with Cromwell's help, and farming damn badly at that. You're making a fool of yourself. Cromwell's been dead a long time. The critics and the audience, when they see that RT is doing a new drama series, they expect it to be a hit. But not everything is going to hit all of the right notes with all of the right people every time. Don't. And therefore, when you have very little output, the audience are much more critical, I think. And I think that's why the weaknesses of the Year of the French, in the context of being the only significant offering at that time, were very evident and very obvious. The country needs peace, an end to all this. It wasn't as effectively written. Uh, my memory of it was just, you know, one battle scene after another. It was a very expensive production, and uh, little boys liked it very much. The Year of the French was, in, in a sense, a victim of its own ambition, I think. I didn't think the adaptation was all that great. Um, I didn't think that there was intrinsically a great deal of dramatic meat in it. Confine your children! That's one of the reasons, I think, why it didn't seem to quite reach the epic grandeur that it sought. Get these children off the streets, inside, inside! You were giving exposition, you're telling them this is the history of the place, this is what was happening, this is what led up to it, none of which is inherently dramatic. It's fine for a documentary, but I, I, I couldn't see it as a uh, drama series. Jesus Christ! You would really have to take the thread that held it together and pull the thread out and almost rewrite the book. I certainly wouldn't have asked for such a mammoth job. <laughs> I think that the impact that it had on RTE was a loss of confidence. Uh, they saw that it didn't succeed. Steady. But they didn't push that further to really analyse why it didn't succeed. I know what happened to it. Some people believe that literature, by its nature, should be dramatised and put on television, regardless of whether or not it is suitable for television. Now, that's what happened to that. You need to have a lot of courage to put up with failure and to keep going. And, and if you don't have failures, you're never going to find out anything about anything. We're here to bring you liberty! Long live the Republic of France! The Year of the French was a, a noble failure in its own terms. And, and I think it did affect the way in which RTE approached drama and drama series from that time on. Something like that happening was a major blow. They couldn't comprehend this happening after Stop It, and they couldn't believe that 
you get up and you do the next one. The continuity that really matters in a place, that you, you start off with something like a Reardon's and you end up with a strumpet city. And now it doesn't matter that they are completely different artifacts, but you have to keep going to get to that and then you have to keep going to get beyond that. Romance was directed by Pat O'Connor and challenged traditional images of rural Ireland by showing the reality of economic decay and intense sexual repression. Individual productions, that's the stuff of drama, where there's a beginning, a middle and an end and an audience has something to think about. Who's that you've got, Brady? I don't know his name. Are you good at the foxtrot? He's good looking. Are you thinking of emigrating? Oh, I hope you won't go. I can't stop them. It's not necessarily how it begins or ends. It's the thoughts that are on the celluloid. Go to your mammy, bud. And it, it allows the audience to go away and make its mind up. It forces the audience to go away if it's really good to make its mind up. Man. Listen, Brady, we'll get your coat and we'll get off on the bikes. And we'll go into the field. Have your kiss in your bridey, you'll say. But we rest no. ourselves. And I'll tell you something. I don't like being kissed by you. I don't like the sweat on the sides of your face and the way your teeth stick into me. And I don't like the way you take a swig of a bottle every time before you, you have a go at me. Despite the impact of this film and others, the 1980s saw a relentless decline in the volume and variety of RTE's output. I explained the decline in, in, in drama by the fact that there's no philosophy of where drama fits in to, uh, you know, um, the national output, if you like. As drama costs rose, co-productions became more important. This one, The Price, was originally set in Corsica. The Price was, was dealing with contemporary Irish experience, but it was doing it too much in relation to a kind of international genre formula and allowing too much of the writing and production to be done by people who didn't have a sense of the texture of Irish society. If I look at the 80s, I suppose what I think may have happened was some kind of a loss of nerve. I think perhaps costs began to be looked at very carefully. The whole business of, are we able to afford drama? Um, I think it showed in the absence of real work that seemed to come forward. We are constantly looking for co-production partners, which has an impact on the types of project you can do, where you can place it in the schedule, the creative uh, compromises you have to make. All of these things, which are not ideal and not conducive, as far as I'm concerned, to the best possible exploration of that sort of uh, creative ability within, within your own country. Although single dramas went into long-term decline through the 1980s, the role of series and serials continued to play a central role in RTE's output, and so did Wesley Burroughs. Gabriel Byrne, he had been very popular with the audience. When they took the Reardons off and they wanted a, a spin-off, that was the obvious one that we should follow. He had moved over the mountains from Wicklow and we would, we would have him move back to where his father had just died and take up his story from them. Bracken also introduced two new characters. Well, Pat, Denny, how are you? Sorry for your trouble. I enjoyed Bracken more than anything I did on, on television, either uh, the Reardon or Glen Rowan. Thanks, Miley. You're a pal. Gabriel, who was the sex symbol of the age. It seemed an awful waste not to have a lot of sex in the programme when Gabriel was around. I thought I might offer you a lift. You'll want to get yourself a decent car. Is Mr. Daly at home? And we had the beautiful Dana Winter, who was playing his, his girlfriend's mother. Will he be back? I'll ask him to get in touch. So we had all kinds of, of areas of suggestibility. <laughs> I was sorry to hear about your father. Did you know? 
Not very well. I don't think he liked me very much. He had no taste. In the second series of Bracken, the focus shifted. A lot of the spotlight shone on Dinny and Miley, and I think the public got to like them a lot, and they were a very sound basis for a new, a new series. My brief was that we should have a program that was just a bus ride away from Dublin, and yet the, the, the people were just emerging from a purely rural background. Now, we had these two guys coming down from the mountain, coming up to a place, a sort of market gardening area close to Dublin, where they were selling fruits and vegetables straight to the supermarkets. Well, I don't know if we're doing right at all. So it was, it was quite a move forward from them, and also it put us in touch with, with urban ways. Oh, this is Biddy, my daughter. Biddy, these are the new neighbours, Dinny Byrne and Miley. <laughs> are you cutting me or what, Mary? Why would I? A little slip of a thing like yourself with a grown-up daughter. I'll go with that. <laughs> Your father's a great gift for flattery, <laughs> Miley. Biddy runs the place. Um, sit down, please. Our attitude in Glenrow tended to be more the ordinary human dilemmas that happened within a family context. You know what you need, Dinny? A woman. Rather than a, a, the context of a, a full society, which was our brief in, in, uh, in the Reardon's. What's the verdict? Real mountainy men, aren't they? I suppose so. Still, they're nice. There was a different feel to Glenrow because the nation was on the march. So Glenrow really moved into kind of mainstream soap action, as you would see it in the, the British soaps. The ring. Glenrow wasn't alert enough to the new tensions in the Irish society of its time. In his earlier work, there was a kind of zeal for liberal disclosure and, and liberal reform. And uh, when it came to Glen Rowe, he, he said publicly over and over again that he was finished with that. It was more difficult to write on, on issues, you know, to explore issues. But I felt all along, even towards the end of the Reardon's, I felt very strongly that it wasn't my place to be exploring issues. You say you're not the father. That's the truth. Could you have been? In 1988, after a gap of almost two decades, RTE reintroduced a Dublin drama serial to its schedules. It represented a major investment by the station. Because it was so long in coming, RTE really knew that it had to get it right. I thought you liked the money. It got off to a bad start, oh. and it was just trying too hard without being clear enough about what it actually was that it was trying to do. So there was this notion of, of urban life, where there just a lot of people coming and going and shouting at each other, but they were shouting each other too much about too little. But you know, if you have played before, it isn't right to pretend otherwise. She never played before. Well, then how come she knew what a run was before anyone ever told her? Don't be such a sour loser. She Nicola. won fair and square, Nicola. Come on. Losing. Oh, I do. I hate. It's evolved. It's improved enormously. Some episodes are brilliantly written and really capture uh, the tensions of contemporary urban society. Don't you come near me. That's all the thanks I get. I'm warning you. Why? Why? What are you going to do? <laughs> huh? Huh? I'm glad you lost that little sprog. To oh. show sort of vindictive little bitch you were. Huh? Huh? Come on. How ungrateful can you get? You are soiled goods, Carol. As the 1990s progressed, the levels of RTE drama production began to rise again. I know the way you fellas operate. I know the way you can cut things up and... Well, she only told me the morning she left. I'm going to have an abortion. That's what I'm doing, you see. Bonsoir. Good abend. Dobre vietur. You please explain why you ran out the door of the Luxembourg grill in that lawn. Brendan came round to comfort me. He stayed for a cup of tea and ended up riding me. Good morning, Vietnam! Sarah. Please be brave and pray. 
someday the whole truth will come out. That's the strange thing about the truth. It always comes out in the end. Of course. Of course it was. Oh, yes. Detective Inspector Mammy strikes again. I mean, I would just like to know who exactly you think you are, Mammy. I mean, excuse me, Mrs. Mammy, but I just didn't happen to know that you were in the CID, if you understand my meaning. I smashed their sacred service. I made their black and tans fear for their lives. I am the elusive pimpernel that could ever capture our defeat. All of this their newspapers made me. I am the only unknown quantity you have. You put my clogs under that table in Downing Street, and they will see what clay my feet are made of. Roddy Doyle's quartet of films, Family, made an enormous impact in the mid-90s. His work seemed, in some respects, to be a development of the pioneering dramas produced by RTE in the 1970s. Well, Roddy Doyle's family would indeed, I suppose, be the, the next of kin to Martin Cluxton. But it's a sad thing to think of the wasteland that ran between. That's, uh, you know, a pity. Oh, I'm talking! Jesus! Now. Let go. Bastard. Fooled you, huh? Now. I've said it before. If I'm late in future, if I'm delayed, you'll wait, you wait? You're bleeding, wait! It's all right, Leah. Chips shouldn't bounce. Eileen's got to get on great at St. A Love Divided <laughs> is, so far, the only feature film in which RTE has been the major investor. Well, Sheila, there's no minds to be made up. Eileen is a baptised Catholic, and you made a solemn vow the day I married you all your children would be brought up in the principles of their faith. And that means going to St. Bridget's. Wednesday then, Sean. Thanks for tea, Sheila. The Love Divided was a very interesting example of new Irish filmmaking. Firstly, because it was a high-quality film film put together at relatively modest cost. The other aspect that's extraordinary is that clearly it's a fiction film which touched a nerve in this time and this place. Uh, I frankly thought it was going to be a television film, but uh, I was clearly pleased to be so completely wrong. When it was brought out into our cinemas, it made over £450,000. You're still bad. I think it, it clearly it was a well-acted, well-produced piece, but it was also to do with telling the story of the Fettered on Sea boycott um, at a point when Ireland wanted to bring those skeletons out of the closet, if, if I can put it that way. You've been told what's expected of you, and we've come to make sure that you're listening. I fought for this country, and I look at you, sex is shite. And I wonder if it was all worthwhile. You're all barred. And if you come in here again, you better bring guns. We don't need guns. Yes, you fucking do. In an ideal world, the role of a national public service broadcaster uh, should be to, to stimulate and provide creative opportunities and to play a significant part in the cultural life of the society. And in any examination, that includes the production of, of indigenous feature films. The emergence of independent producers making TV drama outside RTE introduced another new factor. As the independent producer became a more frequent animal, I think that there were certainly elements within RTE who perceived that as threatening. And there were no kind of clear set routes in. Now, I, you know, Orchie recognised that and, and have since restructured, so there, there's a very clear avenue, if you like, into Orchie for whatever strand of programming it is that you want to discuss with them. Your breakfast, sure. Your breakfast, sure. 
I think the future of, of Irish fiction, of, of storytelling, was very dependent on the health of Irish television drama. And because of the situation Orty finds itself in the moment, that's a very big issue for us because drama is very, very expensive uh, to produce. The costs of drama production may have risen, but there have also been some attempts to exploit new technology. Notably, under the category of imaginative approaches, I think new technology, digital video, when the aesthetic matches the budget, when the aesthetic and the technology go hand in hand together, enables Irish filmmakers to make powerful, relevant, sharp, modern drama at lower levels of budget. She's back now with her tail between her legs, back to shack up with you and your lovely home with your mates. Me and in Barry recent here. years, Michael almost Lloyd all of the new Lloyd. Irish drama seen on RTE has been produced from outside the station. Do not assume. Maybe she's back with some big fucking Wall Street guy with loads of money and jobs and stuff. It is crucial for the life of RTE as a public service broadcaster or a broadcaster of any kidney to continue to be able of itself to produce and to make and to transmit indigenous Irish drama. Mr. Waits. For the first time in many years, there has been an opportunity for new and experimental types of drama. Joyce! Joyce, you team of bastards! Oh Christ, Bill's drunk again. You stole the whole fucking thing! I didn't, Brendan! You stole an arm of armor! I did not, I appropriated it. Appropriate. You can tell that simplest written blind prick that if I ate ten tins of alphabet soup, I'd show you the better milk than you lizards! You better step the line. RTE's in-house drama is now entirely confined to the production of one soap. All the funding that's available through our in-house production budgets goes towards Fair City, which, you know, is now running year-round four episodes a week. Um, and that's a significant sum of money. That's the reason why we're not producing any other in-house drama. In the long term, it is something that we would aspire to. If it isn't a little bastard son... You can get out now! <laughs> Come to watch, have you? Whilst I can see why ORT maintained the soaps inside the walls of Montrose, I don't think that that's ultimately necessary. I don't see what reason there is for an independent producer not to be providing soaps to the network. However, they are actually doing fantastically well at the moment. So if it's not broke, don't fix it. By the same token, there's no reason why the independent producer can't supply the same service. The Beckett on Film project was produced by an independent company, but it was also a project in which RTE played a leading role. Little is left to tell. In the last... We took, essentially, Irish text written by an Irish man, uh, probably the most important playwright of the last century, and we gave it a, a, a new meaning, I suppose, by bringing contemporary talent in to represent it in a filmic or televisual way. And it's travelled all around the world and it has received, you know, great praise and, and accolades and awards and all that stuff. Nothing is left to tell. Forty years after RTE began its history of drama production with classic Irish plays, we might seem to have come full circle, but this time the context is very different. I think it would be inconceivable that the trend to produce more drama outside of RTE um, could ever be reversed. No matter how you shaped it or which individuals are involved, I don't think you'd get the same uh, striking and imaginative range of filmmaking if it was done by a group uh, fixed within one uh, organization. Strong young man available for all kinds but of But some jobs. feel that the independent in sector in itself cannot provide the same environment for close collaborative working relationships in the way that a large organization such as RTE can. Jamie, I'm not a strong young man. You're not? Well then, who? I think there is a certain communality and a skills base within RTE, which it would be a great pity to lose. What are you going to be doing? Management. I think one of the things that the independent sector misses is any kind of common aim, goal, sense of community of itself as an Irish-making, uh, film-making, drama-making body. 
she eats a girl. <laughs> The last year, two years, RT has, has been consistently making quality television drama. I don't think that that ever happened before consistently. And consistency is, is you know, it's the key. You're as fit as a fiddle. And why am I so tired all the time? Because of the success of the drama and the opportunity it has afforded a lot of the creative talent, there are lots of interesting projects around. And an expectation from the audience that they will see something different on RT. It's original indigenous drama. You won't get it anywhere else. What's up? It's not that pain again, is it? In my opinion, the whole purpose and object of a national broadcaster is to enable the echo of that society to be sent back and, and seen, felt, intuited, um, you know, and, and suffered with by the society within which it lives. Otherwise, it has no purpose. A man went out to find his enemies, and he found no friends. A man went out to find his friends, and he found no enemies. Hey, Flutha. Swag, what? One, uh, one new model. I like the nuns. What do you think? Are you mad? Any trouble around here, and I'm the first to be lured off the Star Street. She could charge you fees just for looking at her. <laughs> But if I want to move my own money, the whole world has to stop me. The dial, you among them, formally elected me as president of the Irish Republic. 